to start. Um, I don't want to uh, take too long. I want to get to these the research conversations now that Gabe and Ben and uh, I think Jenna should be coming in soon. Uh, but the review in chapter 17 is an example that was written for the textbook. And uh, the organizers, the way that one is organized, if you look at chapter 17, if you have your book, it's just good to, to look at it because it's the, that sample review essay that begins on page 306. Um, takes an approach that um, I have since um, worked on and have tried to create a, a different organizer than what is there. Um, in this, in this um, example, the one in the textbook, the paper is divided into uh, how many studies? Um, two studies, two qualitative studies, and three quantitative studies and one mixed method studies. And it's, it's separated in that way and written in that way. And what I did in the Google Doc and in the Google folder is I took the time over the last couple of months to rewrite this essay using the categories that we've talked about the ones which are in the matrix, uh, the research question um, and the, the topic, the design, sampling, data collection, data analysis, and the overall quality or evaluation of the studies, using those as my headers for the sections and then writing about the six studies or some of those studies within those categories, within those headers. And so I think, it's worth looking just so that you know that the, ex the examples that I want you to look at and pay attention to are slightly different than the ones that are in the book. Okay, now that's why we that's why I put them there. And that's why they're so Im important. And what that really reflects is the um, development and the evolution of the idea of how to write an essay. And so I think what I've done is uh, use that organizer for a reason, and that is so that you can really, uh, so that I can, uh, so that we can see the kinds of understanding that you have of research design and of sampling and and of uh, measurement uh, a little more clearly. And so you synthesize around your articles around those different categories. So let me just, so you just, so you see that. Let me go to the um, EDU 600. Here it is. And I'm going to share the screen so that you can see it. The Google Doc is the one that carries the, and I'll put, let me just, first of all, so that you can go to it, I'll put that link to the Google Doc in the chat. And everyone should be able to use that. So if you have your Google open, you can use go to that. And I'm going to share that on my screen now. So you can do that independently, but I'll just show you where I'm at here. So this is where the folder, and this should look pretty familiar by now. Um, this is where this folder then is the has, has the material that I want you to pay attention to. So in this chapter seven, 17 final review and comparison matrix, this, this thing is full of models. And I think that's one of the things that has helped get people started. But over here in the top left corner, you see this, there's, it's called AAT, Animal Assisted Therapy, Chapter 17, new, uh, our new Chapter 17 model for this review. And you can see how, how that differs from the one that's in the textbook in that it's organized into those categories and uses some of those 
uh, strategies, writing strategies that I've been talking about. Uh, here are the two, two or three best articles. Here's a qualitative and a quantitative and comparing them. Uh, here are the ones that were the, were the most helpful to me to understand this connection to practice, you know, and, uh, and so forth. So I would say, if you're going to look at, a, at that model, Kelsey, and chapter 17 has, you know, uh, some really important pages, especially 301, 302, those are important pages for the matrix. Uh, but that also you look at this one in conjunction with the, the sample uh, matrix for the, the, I didn't redo the matrix, but I did rewrite that entire review. So you would rather have us do the new follow the new model that's in the Google Drive. That right, you're and this saying. model, yes, this model is is in alignment with the other models in this folder. Okay. And do you have a rubric too, or just a, an example? Exemplar? Well, there's, there's, here's, here's a rubric. There's two, ru two or three rubrics that you can use that okay. are in here to guide your and it doesn't matter which one. There's not a better. Well, they're, they're all aligned. The, the, you know, in terms of you know, the, I use the one over here to show you all of the different descriptors. The one, this next steps rubric is actually, I think, the easiest to use because it just tells you this is what the expectation is in this uh, center column, and then you can kind of you know use this as a self assessment. So I. I I tend to like this one. This is a, a more recent development in rubric making that I worked on with Anita Stewart McCafferty a couple of years ago that I really think is very useful um, and uh, helps self-assessment and goal setting and is, is a lot cleaner than, than this one, which is great, but it's so cluttered that eh, kind of loses a little bit of its impact, I think. For, for learning, for assessment, it's great. Okay. So uh, yeah, the, the, all the rubrics are all contained there. If you have any questions about the either one or both, please let me know. Okay. So uh, what I wanna do is just go right ahead and, and uh, have uh, the start here with, I've, I've set up a, um, a, uh, if, if any of you are, are familiar with Jamboard, who uses Jamboard? Okay, so Jamboard's a, a you know a posting um, Google app, and so I've set up a Jamboard for feedback for for Gabe and for Ben. I've set Gabe's up already, so um, I, I'm going to volunteer you to be our first, if you would. <laughs> Gabe, sounds good. Um, and so what I'd like to do is to uh, just again uh, let me just quickly. Uh, show you the here's the here's the uh, jam board. I'll put the link in here for you so that you can all will what we'll do is take the time to have a present your make your presentation. So I'll give you 10, 11 minutes. Since you're the first one, you get the little bit of a, a latitude there. Um, and then we'll stop, have some questions, and then we'll take a, a five five to seven minute break to um, do do the feedback. So maybe I'll maybe I'll wait. So I'll wait. Yeah, no, I tell you what, I'll do that. So there's that. Uh, that's a feedback for for um, Gabe. And I have another one for Ben. And um, when Jenna gets here, we'll have another. So I've, I've created, I've uh, we can share the screen if you like, Gabe. Yeah. So if you want to take a minute to get ready. Um, oh, no, I'm good to go. Ready? Okay. All right. <laughs> So I'm going to hand, right. the, hand off the, uh, the the big squares here, all the Zoom squares to you. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, fair warning. My internet has been iffy today, so I might just disappear for like 10 seconds. But then I'll come back and then we'll figure out where I left off. Um, it's right now. Let's go here. Okay, so the first article that I'm going to tell you guys about, actually, let me just adjust the screen here so that I can see the, the tabs at the top of the screen. Okay, so this first article uh, was written by Sam Weinberg and Sarah McGrew, and it was published in 2019, and it's called Lateral Reading in the Nature of Expertise, Reading Less and Learning More when evaluating digital information. And it's very much concerned with this idea of civic online reasoning, um, which is defined as the ability to effectively search for, evaluate, and verify social and political information online. So, you know, to evaluate the credibility or trustworthiness of websites. So in their sample, they had 10 PhD historians. They had 10 professional fact checkers who worked for respected news organizations, and they had 25 uh, Stanford University undergraduate students. Um, and they chose these people because they're all skilled internet users. They want to see how skilled internet users do it. And so they asked the subjects to verbalize their thoughts while they were evaluating a website. They had several tasks and um, their verbalizations were recorded and then rubrics were developed in order to assess the quality of the subjects evaluations. So one of the tasks presented the subjects with this website and their job was to you know, assess how trustworthy this website was. And this is an article and it makes the argument that um, raising the minimum wage would be bad for like businesses and the economy overall. And it's on minimumwage.com. Now the participants were not told that this is actually a cloaked website, which uh, is created by Berman and Company, which is a public relations firm that uh, is owned by Richard Berman, who lobbies on behalf of the restaurant and hotel industries, who obviously are not, uh, you know, that, that's, they definitely have a bias when it comes to the issue of minimum wage. Um, so that's what the researchers were hoping that the subjects would figure out in their evaluations. But if they didn't make any progress after five minutes, then they were prompted to look for the sponsoring person or organization behind this website. And so here's the bad news. Less than half of the students, these Stanford University students, uh, figured out that Berman was behind this website. And of the few who did figure it out, it took them seven minutes. Um, only six out of the 10 historians figured that figured out Berman was behind it. And it took them an average of six minutes. So what did these students and uh, these historians do wrong? Well, they stayed inside the website for too long. They would read through the article and then they might click over here and you know they were encouraged to you know use the internet as they would normally or open new tabs for but a lot of them would you know just kind of look around they say oh yeah cool this shows me what the minimum wage is in every state you know this must be a valuable source of information We'll be patient here. I think we just lost Gabe, right? They did that using this skill yeah. called, uh, oh, did you lose me for a second? Yes. Ah, okay, where did I leave off? Uh, 20 seconds ago. Okay, cool. What was, what was I saying around that time? You were just beginning to talk about this page. Okay, gotcha. So yeah, basically the historians and the students hit a dead end because they stayed inside the website for too long. Um, but the good news is that the fact checkers 
um, every single one of the 10 fact checkers figured out that Berman was behind this website. And they did it in an average of three and a half minutes. So way faster than anyone else. And the way they did that was by using the skill lateral reading. And this is what I think, you know, I really want to like teach my students. Um, so the way that they do it, you know, lateral reading really means opening new tabs and seeing what like other reliable sources on the internet have to say about whatever is behind this website. And so a good starting place is to go to the about tab and then look, this is a project of the Employment Policies Institute. What's that? Okay, this is see the real victims of higher minimum wage laws. Interesting. Let's go to the about us tab here. And then the fact checkers uh, who were, you know, talking while they were researching, they were like, well, this is no help at all. This doesn't really tell me anything substantial about the EPI. And so then they would just do, they would open up a new tab and just do a Google search, Employment Policies Institute. And then they would scan the results page. They wouldn't just click on one of the first links. That's what a lot of the students did. Instead, they would go down, they'd see the Wikipedia, and they know Wikipedia has flaws, but they also know that it's a good starting point for research. So they would right click, open it up in another tab, but continue to look for more reliable sources. New York Times, you know, um, fact checkers have a specialized knowledge of what news sources that are reliable or not. And most people generally agree that this is a reliable source of information. So they would do that. They might go to the second page of the Google results even, which like no one does. And then they would explore. And then Wikipedia just lays it out. You know, this is here, uh, the staff all work for Berman and Company, which is a public affairs firm owned by Richard Berman, who lobbies for the restaurant, hotel, alcoholic, beverage, and tobacco industries. And then they can go over here into the article and do Command F and just search Berman. And then, oh, look, Richard Berman has made millions of dollars in Washington by taking up the causes of corporate America. So these are the, you know, the skills that fact checkers used and they got good results every single time on all the tasks. Okay, so now let me tell you about my second study. This one. Uh, so this was written by Sarah McGrew and Virginia Byrne and they published in 20 Can we teach high school students to use hey, these Dave, skills? Dave, Dave, um, Dave. Lost you again. You left off it. This is an article by Sarah McGrew. Okay, so it was uh, written by Sarah McGrew and Virginia Byrne, and they published in 2020. And it's called "Who Is Behind This: Preparing High School Students to Evaluate Online Content." And uh, Sarah McGrew was part of the research team on the article we just talked about. And so she was trying to extend the findings um, by you know, trying to figure out how can we teach high school students to use these fact checker skills, you know, to use these lateral reading skills and to think about the, you know, what is behind the information you know, that we find online, the source. Um, more specifically, they wanted to determine the ways in which student evaluations of online content would change or improve after a series of six lessons in civic online reasoning. So they designed these lessons in collaboration with six teachers um, at a high school and their student sample, which was 420 students, uh, consisted entirely of these teachers, students. So that's a non-random sample. And the way they did it is they administered equivalent pre and post tests um, where students would have to complete constructed response items. And they would do that, you know, the pre-test before the six lessons 
and the post test after the six lessons instead of gone mind reasoning. Um, so the research discusses two of the constructed response prompts that students were given, and I'll tell you about one of them. It was the uh, website evaluation task. This is, so this is what the uh, high school students would see. Um, and they'd be given a URL, they'd have to say yes or no, is this a website a trustworthy source for learning about global warming? And then they would have to give an explanation and cite URLs for any uh, sources. And um, so let's do it. CO2science.org, what's that all about? So I feel like a lot of students would be fooled by a website like this because look, it's got visual displays of data. It's got professional looking citations. It looks like somebody put a lot of work into it. But what the researchers were hoping is that the students would go to the About Us tab. And then there you go. This is the organization that funds this website. And so let's open a new tab and just do a quick Google search. And then maybe the students will go to the Wikipedia. And then there it is. This is this group that made that website is seen as a front group for the fossil fuel industry. And the website actually tries to present quote unquote scientific evidence that um, increased CO2 levels are good for the environment. Um, so this is definitely Oh, we're missing those. The, the, these are the, the lost the lost seconds. <laughs> Here are the results. Hey, hey uh, Gabe, we just had yeah. a little bit of a glitch there as you were talking just after you said the website uh, was a front for CO2. Okay, cool. We're, we're... Yes, gotcha. So um, they would hit the Wikipedia page here. They'd figure that out and um, right, so then they might go down and then, you know, see Wikipedia often has good links to uh, reliable sources of information and they might click on a USA Today or the Seattle paper, or this one's actually a Guardian website. And then they could open that up and then they could do a command F and just search that name of that organization. And then there, so now you've got evidence. They've insisted wrongly that carbon emissions are not a threat. So now you, the students would have hard evidence. So, right. That's what researchers were hoping students would do more on the post-test, but here are the results. So, um, you can see the students on the pretest, you know, light blue is pretest, dark blue is post-test. So students on the pretest, 0% uh, of them successfully use lateral reading skills, and that went up to 5% on the post-test. You can also see there are a lot more attempt, unsuccessful attempts to do lateral reading than there was on the pretest. And also there was a lot more people who clicked the about us tab. Um, that's what that increase signifies. Um, you can also see uh, that the number of students who evaluated the website on the basis of its contents, you know, who stayed with too long inside the website and were not really focused on the source of the information, decreased significantly from the pretest to the post test. But you can also see that more than half of the students were still not um, using any kind of like focus on source. Uh, in their evaluations on the post-test. And so the researchers kind of tried, they suggested that maybe six lessons spread out across a semester is not enough to really like get students to hone these skills. Um, all right, just have to stop the share. All right, and that's it. Great. Well, thank you. 
Uh, if that's if that's again, let's give him a thunderous round of applause, everyone. Yay. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you so much, Gabe. That was great. And you know what is so uh, fantastic about the topic is that you found something that was immediately useful to you in this. It seemed like this is something. And I was really kind of wondering if this was going to to be something that would, you know, you'd find and you it, you hit it. And this was really an interesting point because this is something that I, I haven't seen actually done before as a topic and I'm a little surprised now. Uh, so that was really a, a great, you know, connection of the two of making this what looks like a really theoretical activity, something that really hit home. So thanks for doing that. That's a great topic. Um, uh, the question I, I had was, um, I like the, the you you concluded the second one by looking at those uh, bar graphs, which were really convincing. You could see, uh, you could see the the uh, the changes there and the comparisons. But back to the to the qualitative study, um, you you talked about the people in the study, but how did they actually do the analysis? What did they look at? Did they interview them? Did they look at where they clicked? Uh, what was their actual the, the the researcher strategy there for data analysis? Um, yeah, so they developed, they recorded, they asked every subject to verbalize their thoughts while they were evaluating websites. Uh, you know, those verbalizations were recorded with like audio recording and then the, you know, the researchers listened back to those and they developed a rubrics so that they could basically rate the, you know, scoring ability on like a five point scale or something. Okay. And so they, do they, so did they use those scores to do the, do the, uh, the kind of their analysis or was it more of, yeah. Uh, with the recordings and that kind of stuff. I was just curious because you the qualitative side of that um, is really interesting because they're talking about their they'd be able to talk about things as well. Yeah, I mean they also present a lot of thick descriptions, uh, meaning quotes uh, from like what the subjects were saying while they were speaking, and they really derived a lot of their points when they're trying to figure out, you know, what are these fact checkers doing so well? Um, they were able to kind of draw those conclusions in that way. Um, another thing that they also did um, for measurement was they measured the amount of time that it took uh, the subjects to achieve, like how many seconds until they reached a, a goal of like finding out who was actually behind the website and they compared those. Right. Right. Yeah. So like for the subject, the subject we were talking about, a uh, minimum wage, the minimum wage.com one, you know, score of zero was, you know, they evaluate minimum wage.com based on service features. They don't identify connection to the employment policy institute and right. then the highest possible score which was the four um was you know they determined that the employment policies institute sponsors minimumwage.com and is a front site created by berman and company a public relations firm thank you Are there are questions or thoughts, some reflections on? Um, I already posted uh, the thing that I learned, but I really wanted to say that I'm so glad you showed us how to do this because I never would have known to go to the about us tab. Mm -hmm. Like that's, I mean, it, it seems so simple, but I just like, <laughs> I just never yeah. thought of doing it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's specialized knowledge, but it's something that you can teach to young people. Yeah, you know? and it's something that they can understand. Like it, it, there's like a step-by-step -step process that's easy to grasp. I'm definitely yeah. gonna use that for myself. <laughs> Abe, how did you come up? I mean, it's fabulous. It's not just for the social studies parts of us, but anybody who uses online research. How did you come up with the topic? How did you how did you center on this? It's very practical uh, usage. Yeah, I mean, it's really just because, you know, so I'm in the first year of the two-year ETEP program, uh, and I'm going for that social studies 7 to 12 certification. And so I feel like there's a good chance that, you know, relatively soon I will have a class, social study class. And I feel like the most important thing, the most beneficial thing I can do for my students is teach them how to evaluate the credibility of online information. Like number one, that's for me. Right. And, and we talk about information literacy quite a bit, you know, but I think it's uh, connect, the, the idea of making this connect with the, the idea of reading is something that's caught my eye too. that, that it's not simply a look, what's the format, what's the, you know, content or something, you know, that, that there's some moves there that, that makes sense. And I think it's also, you're also um, pointing out a, a kind of a, a new standard, which is Wikipedia. And Wikipedia has evolved um, and yeah. it has been, you know, created by the users. Uh, and I just saw a, um, I was watching the Trevor Noah show and he, he interviewed the woman who's the CEO of Wikipedia about where are they now, where, how have they arrived there and what are the, what are their, what are, what are they trying to do? And at once upon a time, Wikipedia was not held in the same regard as a site, but it, it has, again, it has evolved and it has gone through a lot of, of that kind of uh, organizational learning. And they're still adjusting to uh, you know, new demands that are being made on them. But, but that's interesting um, as, a, as a source too. Yeah, Kelsey? I also thought like, cause I remember you talked about this, Gabe, like at the beginning you had mentioned doing something like that. And I thought that was really interesting, but wondering like how you would gather, like what these, what the data would actually look like for these things. Like, I don't know how you would measure it. So it was really interesting to, I think it was the first one that um, measured the time that it took for the different like groups of people to find the information. I thought that was an, an interesting, I, I wouldn't have known how to like quantify success in that area. So I thought that was interesting. Um, it was like an interesting way to, to gather information. Yeah. And honestly, that first um, research article is a good read. Like it's just, it's just really well written and eloquent. And, you know, it, it's not like super like bland or dull. Like it's actually like quite engaging, you know, so. Weinberg 2019, guys. It at least I know you guys it. all want more research articles on your plate. <laughs> well, but, but, but I'll this take is, it. But, yeah. but this is a, this this hits a universal theme. That is, we're all technology users now. I don't know that there's anyone on this in this class or in any of my classes who is not on their computer searching, and so the the idea that we know all about searching is certainly been challenged by the kind of research that's being conducted because they're looking and they're trying to figure this out, in, you know, in terms of, you know, learning, but also uh, for the, you know, and th with that goes the content of the websites. And so you have my attention because I'm doing the same thing, you know, searching is a part, a deliberate part of this class. So Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing your paper and um, uh, transferring some of the skills into future classes. So Thanks. let's take, um, so what I'd like, Ben, I'd like if you would uh, get ready and let's, everyone can take a five minute break. If you wanna walk away, take a break, that's fine. But also go to the, um, uh, to the, to the Jamboard if you would and, and leave uh, two, two posts for Ben 
that would be yeah so there's a there's four pages there there's a what did you what one thing i learned a question i have a resource you might want to uh, use a connection i made to my practice are some of the prompts that are there or you can make up your own but um that's the the feedback i'd like uh, for us to use or the prompts i'd like us to use for um the uh research uh conversation so thanks again gabe for getting this started will it's well let's come back at um let's see i'm look my iphone says 541 at 546 so take five get uh ben you can get queued up but everyone can just take a breather okay Okay, Ben, how's your internet faring today? <laughs> Mine's great. I'm at, uh, I live at the school, so it's, it's always high speed. If you, if it goes out for even a second, the, uh, the dorm kids flock out into the common room, like, <laughs> like, like the, room. By the gods. open rebellion. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> that is funny. Cause they're all what in their, in their rooms, gaming away or something. They're, yeah. Too many of them do that. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, you know, you, you, you need it. <laughs> that's what you, you expect the service to be there. Yes, that's true. That's yeah. true. Um, great. Well, thanks for doing this. Appreciate it. Um, um, so you're, are, are you at the beginning of your degree? I think, are you, did you transfer in some courses or? I'll be transferring in like 12 credits from UNE. Okay. And so I have some of them about half, halfway up to this course or okay. something like that. Yeah. Good. Let me just talk to Jenna a little bit. Hey, Jenna. Hey, Jeff. How are, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. All right. So we got this off the ground. Thank you for volunteering to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 10 minutes? Uh, rough, a little, uh, rough, about a little bit longer than 10, but I, I'm, okay. I'll, I'll put a, um, I'll wave at the 10 minute mark okay i mean okay. you guys you being the you know starting this off i'm giving um you know and i think 
I'm going to have people in groups, so it can be a little bit longer than 10 minutes. But when I say 10 minutes, it helps keep it tight. I'm not sure quite where I'm going to fall. Um, well, <laughs> well, uh, like I said, well, I'll, I'll be a, certainly um, more um, able to give you some time. Um, but here's a here's a strategy. You know, when someone says you have time and then you have questions, just if it's time, then wrap it up. And then when someone asks you a question, say, and here's something else I wanted to say. <laughs> I love that strategy. So, so, you know, hey, the floor is yours. Use it, you know. Politician style, huh? That is exactly right. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I am, I'm a research politician, you know, whatever you want to say. Yes. <laughs> My background's in public policy, so that's. Right. The, the uh, right, the, the, the mic will come back to you. And so just hold on to it. All right. Okay. Good. All right. Oh, Jeff, I wanted to ask you, since I came in late from that other thing, um, you said something about a jam board. What is a jam board? Well, a jam board, mm -hmm. let me show you. A jam board is it's a Google app. That is a, um, it's like a, 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 a posting wall. So let me show you what I have here. Okay. Thanks. So it's just, if you look in your Google um, apps, there's this, it has this little logo, the, the circle with the okay. two squares on it. And so you just basically have these white spaces. So it's like a whiteboard. And mm -hmm. you just, if you click on this icon over here, do you see yeah. this? Yeah. And I click on it, then my, then this becomes a, And I just leave it, I post that message and, uh, or I can leave a note. I can just say, uh, the notes are really the most clever way to do this because then they become, you know, the things you, and, and that's it. That's the, that's the it. There's no more, yeah. there's no more to it than that. And I can, and I have a number of, of, uh, I can set up four different prompts and then i can go back afterwards and sort them out and stuff that's really cool i had not heard of this before well and the reason i like it i've you know a couple of people have have talked about it uh is that it's in the google suite and it's it, so you i just go over to my yeah. google wherever i am and i say pull up jamboard and it does it and it embeds it right into the google folder yeah that is excellent yeah, yeah, it's it's very it's very straightforward, um, and something that I've come to use. It's, it's it's been around for a while, but I've just started using it myself. Thanks. And there's Ben's, and so I think I've got Ben's. Let me just make sure I've got that link, and I have one set up for you as well. Okay. Okay. So. People are going to be coming back in here. Hopefully, I, I know taking a break is always a risky proposition. But I'm going to go ahead. Um, let's see, everyone, everyone. I am going to put the Jamboard link in to the chat and Ben. Uh, when you're ready, we're ready. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, okay. I can. Yep. So I think actually having Gabe go first makes a pretty good transition for my topic. Uh, I teach math here in high school, and uh, as I'm sure most of you probably feel similarly, like most days my kids are glued to their phones, and if you know. I want to get any instruction that's meaningful. It really is an effort to, to get them not to be on their phones. So, and then I watch them socialize and like they'll get together and, you know, have lunch, which is them eating lunch with their phone in their hand and, and not really uh, talking to get to one another. So, so I think a lot about like what the effects are of that on their emotions, their attention spans, their their learning, especially in school. 
So my topic focuses mostly on uh, kind of broadly speaking, like how do these phones, as best we know, how do they affect young people and also people our age? Um, so the two articles that I chose for today, uh, one looks at kind of a comparison between uh, cultures. So looks at a Chinese population and a British population, and I'll describe more about that in a minute, but kind of looking to see like, is there a difference culturally between habits and perhaps adverse effects and their personal thoughts on on phones and and their use and how they impact their lives. So the first study is basically looking to see if there is such a difference. And then it also has a qualitative component that um, helps the reader gain insights into what might contribute to that difference. So the research design was split up into two parts. Uh, there was a qualitative or a quantitative strand that came first. And so there they collect uh, data from the two groups. So from the Chinese group and the British group, and they compare quite a few different variables um, about habits and the effects and uh, kind of an addiction level. And then the second strand is a quant qualitative strand where they go back to both populations and they look and see based on questionnaires and interviews, uh, were these students aware of what might be causing certain trends? Uh, how did they feel about phones in their lives? And as you can imagine, like all that's pretty interesting and, and fairly mixed, like certainly a double-edged sword with the, the phones um, in their lives. So they selected 475 Chinese undergraduate students and 303 British undergraduate students. And it's a tends to be more, uh, I guess, more males in the British group than females and about roughly even in the, in the Chinese group. And all pretty young, but the age range was 18 to 50. So not necessarily everyone in there is a traditional student. So sort of a, uh, has some outliers for sure. And they use this uh, smartphone addiction scale, which I looked at and, you know, it's probably one of those things that most of us don't want to look at because we, we don't fare terribly well, or at least I didn't. And I'm sure my students fare even magnitudes worse, but so I'll show you that real quick. And that's their primary tool for the quantitative aspect of the data. And it's well vetted. Um, they, they assess its validity and reliability for this study, but also for for other studies, including the one where it's created. So let me pull that up for you. So a lot of questions about, you know, how much do phones interrupt their life? How much do they think about them? So just some highlights, missing planned work due to smartphone use. I assume that most of my students or probably at least half would agree with that. I would certainly agree with it on their behalf. Um, trouble concentrating and just a whole span, I guess it's 33 questions that talk about really the impact on learning, on socialization, just on their lives in general. And I haven't given it to my students. I've thought about it. I don't want to, you know, offend them or make them feel like they're being uh, categorized, but I, I do suspect it would be, uh, they would not score terribly favorably on this, this survey. So that's their main tool. And then qualitatively, they followed that up with, uh, for the Chinese students interviews, which the certain students volunteered for. And for the British students, they uh, added on like a qualitative component to the questionnaire. So, so that was how they gathered sort of after the fact qualitative data with the aim of figuring out like, okay, we see the trends in the, in the, SAS or that smartphone addiction survey data, and we want to see if we can glean some human insights into like why those might be or how the kids feel about it. So the data showed that there were significant gender differences. And I had heard some about that before, about how women were 
more prone to, um, I think, being affected mood wise from things like social media than men were. And that seems to be um, somewhat correlated with what they show as far as women scoring more highly, at least in um, these two populations for smartphone addiction, quote unquote. The British scored lower on pretty much all of those parameters. So, so that hones in on like the focus of the study, which is to look at, you know, is there a cultural difference? And they found that there seemed to be one based on their data. And one of the stronger potential causes of that was that the Chinese, for the most part, or my understanding based on these articles is they, they don't really have access to smartphones like we do when they're at home. So they might use their parents on the weekends for gaming, like that was one example. Uh, I think for the most part, they don't get the phones until they go to college. So it's kind of like the, uh, what is it, the Amish have the, the room springer where they, you know, they live this very tight life and then they have a year to go drink and um, date and try everything they want to try. And um, so it kind of reminds me of that where that's what they suggest is potentially responsible for that big cultural differences is the fact that they don't have any regulation or sorry they have a lot of regulation and then suddenly they don't and whereas the british and i would say the americans too for sure like we tend to grow up with these things and so maybe in that sense we learn a little bit more how to regulate them and certainly don't feel like we're being set free when we get to uh, to college so that was my first study. Uh, I found it pretty interesting. I want to show you one table from it that didn't include the US, unfortunately. I'd like to see how we, how we rank on here. But uh, it talks about different populations, different cultures, and then by male and female, basically the amount who hit that threshold for being quote unquote addicted and that threshold that does differ between some of these places. But it was interesting to me, like the Germans seem to be quite low overall. And the British and Chinese were among the higher. So I didn't look into it. But I wondered why I have cousins and an aunt and uncle in Germany. And I wondered why that might be better than it is here or in, in Britain. So um, that was interesting to me to see how that differs by culture. So my second study is, it's an interesting topic, like kind of talking about the effect of having a phone by you on your learning, but also talking about the effect of taking the phone away. So like as, as the teacher, you know, you see the the detrimental effects of a phone, perhaps when it's with them, and you think, oh, I'll just have them leave it by the door or in their bag. And so this study does investigate some that aspect too, like, well, that's going to cause pretty reliably an anxiety spike for the students. And then anxiety, of course, inhibits um, memory and learning in general. So I'm uh, not sure how you win that that balance. But in this study, they look at the effect of smartphones on memory recall. So that's kind of their main dependent variable for both, I would say both branches of the study. And on the second branch, they look at a combination of variables. So affective states, so like emotional state, or is the person anxious, calm, depressed, uh, and so forth. And then phone conscious thought, and that just refers to, are you thinking about your phone? even if it's not with you. And then uh, the smartphone addiction. So again, coming back to that, actually that same scale. Um, so those three variables and their influence on memory recall. And they sampled a smaller group. So 119 undergrad students in an Asian capital city. So uh, based on the first study, I felt like it was probably a pretty good population to sample just because based on that chart I showed you, I think it's fair to assume that this group would have a pretty high 
smartphone use and potentially um, qualify for the addiction category. And then they assign students to either a low phone use group where they have the phone like far away or maybe not with them at all. And then a high phone salience group where it's on their desk or in their hand. And then they compare these different parameters based on those two group uh, separations. So they use the smartphone addiction scale. Again, they use, a, I don't know if you say it, PANIS. It's like a psychological, pretty well vetted um, scale. And they look to see, okay, did having the phone nearby make these outcomes worse? Did having the phone farther away make these outcomes worse? And they really found that um, the absence of the smartphone. So I think as one would expect, like not having it nearby resulted in better scores overall. So tended to be uh, higher memory scores if the phone wasn't with them. And they also found um, somewhat contradicting that having it far away also created a spike in anxiety, but didn't seem to affect the memory as much as they thought it might have. They didn't find any uh, significant correlation between the addiction and the memory recall. So it didn't really seem like being addicted to one's phone was, was bad for memory, which I thought was interesting. It was more like if it was nearby or far away and it's kind of it's distracting pull even if it wasn't actually being used, which is, is kind of crazy to think about. And I think that's about it for what I have. For me, it left me with some, some thoughts on how I might apply it to my classroom. But it's definitely something that like I wish my school would would just lay out a strict policy and say no no phones in the classroom period, but they don't. So it's every teacher kind of regulating it for themselves. And uh, it gives me a little more clarity on how I might use the research to um, change things just enough and hopefully improve the way smartphones are used and not, not being uh, distractors for students. Great. Thank you. Hey, could you just leave that uh, up for just a second, that matrix, Gabe or Ben? Yeah. Great. You want this page or do you want the first page? Uh, no, this this one's good. Uh, this, the, the, the mobile phone's effect of presence on learning and memory. So just go up. There you go. Stop it right there. So congratulations. Yay. Good job. Fantastic. Really fantastic. I am so, I'm well, I'm impressed by the fact that you have a, such a great command. Everyone does. It's remarkable that, that the, all of these um, components and categories really become uh, much more a part of your, your professional language and your repertoire here. So again, uh, that, that's been uh, something that I've noticed very quickly. But I just wanted to point out on your matrix a couple of things uh, that uh, show the, the, how a matrix can be used effectively. And uh, in two spots in particular, in the data collection spot, you've um, identified the, the surveys and then uh, a, a reliability alpha coefficient, a Chromevax alpha. So that's a really good shorthand that just tells you, here's the survey. Here's the reliability. That's you know um, the efficient way of describing that. And then over on the data analysis side, the next column to the right, you know you show your results and you have a correlation coefficient, a p-value, effect size. I mean those are the shorthands. That's why we have statistics because it's the shorthand mm. of giving you a result. And then you just need to have uh, you know a, a brief description of what of what it is you're signifying with the, the statistics. So I think it's, um, um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that you have uh, found so many studies that have an international um, sampling. Yeah, I would say actually that there was really no scarcity at all. I mean, I, I ended up with my six studies partly after culling through a bunch that I felt like maybe weren't relevant enough. So, you know, there was some from Africa and some from Indonesia and some, I mean, really all over the place. And I really wanted at least some applicability to, to my um, context, you know, and Americans and 
so yeah, it's definitely studied um, a lot of places, including in the US. I have another question, but I just wanted to, you can, uh, if you want to stop sharing your screen, uh, that'd be good. If there are, sure. uh, is there, uh, are there other questions or comments? Who here has a policy that's clear, that is, um, you know, that take, so Giovanna has a policy that is there published in, for people to follow, right? It's just really difficult to enforce when you're on remote only uh, uh, standards um, in terms of, I can tell when someone's looking down that they're probably looking at their phone mm -hmm. on Zoom, but mm -hmm. it's harder to enforce when they're uh, at home. Oh yeah, 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 no, no doubt about that. But I think it's also, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I, but I think just the presence of a policy is something that you were getting at, Ben. So go ahead, Chelsea. Well, just the, yeah, I, I think this is such a fascinating topic and the presence of a policy, I think ideally would be really helpful. I find with my students that um, if they don't choose to put it away, then immediately we're in an adversarial place where it's either the next step is to call an admin. And that happens so frequently that I don't find it productive to take it there. So I think that this is really important data to keep in mind and to keep thinking about strategies for um, dealing with that. Also thinking about the anxiety that students have when the phone is taken away. I found that what your information kind of encouraging that they could still kind of focus because that was another concern that I've had is are they just going to think about the fact that it's gone, you know, if I were to take it away. Right. Hey, I also, Ben, I put on the Jamboard, um, is there a flip side? Is there a benefit to smartphone use? Um, and one benefit I found is um, that the laptops are restricted to certain websites and not being able to search for certain terms. So if they're doing a research project on drug use, they can't search for heroin. It, <laughs> it will block it. And okay. so they, they will obviously turn to their smartphone where they're getting it through data and not restricted through you know right. the server at the school yeah. so um i just wondered if you looked at the opposite extreme which was the benefits particularly in the pandemic if a laptop goes down at least they've got access to something yeah yeah um definitely some of the other other four studies i have look more into like one of them it talks about how some of the effects that it, this last study um suggests are perhaps overestimated and then it talks like you're saying about you know what are some of the benefits and um so i tried to get some that were not just my personal bias which is kind of like i think we should just be out of the school altogether but uh tried to get some some balance there and just one other comment i it doesn't surprise me that there are so many other countries involved in these studies because if you think about it smartphones are a lot cheaper than computers um, and in some of the emerging markets, um, uh, which is why a lot of cyber um, uh, stalking happens from countries like Albania and mm -hmm. you know small remote countries because it's a lot easier to uh, to afford a smartphone than it is you know a Mac MacBook. Totally. Yeah. One thing Ben that you made me think about is you said that you were like hesitant to maybe administer the survey to your students, the one that one of the studies used. Yeah, yeah. And it made me think how I actually think that would be super empowering for a lot of students because like Chelsea said, like I feel like all they ever hear from adults is like put your phone away, put your phone away, put your phone away. And, That's true. and so to have them kind of like think about those statements themselves and maybe come to an understanding and awareness of like, oh yeah, I am really anxious when my phone is here, you know. Um, yeah, really, yeah, I just think there's like not it's kind of ironic there's like not a lot of education in schools about the effects of phones it's just like constant behavioral and discipline conversations um so that made me think as far as I put it on the jam board how to maybe have a conversation like in my school in our advisories about that so kids might buy in a little bit more too to putting their phones good, yeah, good point yeah go on Ben yeah it's a great point um it seems like at least in my school where I feel like I'm really good at explaining to kids a lot of the time, like why we do certain things. Like I'm a dorm parent. So I, I live with 30 teenagers full time, which is uh, good birth control. 
Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, I, you know, we try to focus on on why we're doing certain rules, why we're not doing certain things, and um, I think that's important. It's important for me. Like I. Uh, was thinking the other day like I was doing some physical therapy exercises and thinking before I knew why I was doing this it's a lot less compelling when you learn why and then all of a sudden you want to know or you're just more motivated and um so I think that's kind of a blind spot for me is like I haven't really told them why I do just tend to crack down so yeah I will reconsider well, and also, I, you know, I don't know what level you teach, but um, a, a great uh, experienced teacher once said, why don't you, instead of putting your rules out there, have them be part of creating them. And so when I do a code of mm -hmm. cooperation, code of conduct, whatever you want to call it, I'll say, when is it a good time to take your cell phone out? And so, uh, you know, when the rules get right. established, they were part of developing them. And so often it will look like, five minutes at the start of class, five minutes at the end, you know, if you've got to call your mother, you know, and so you step out in the hall. And so it's sort of like with my own children, you know, when is it a good time not to brush your teeth? You know? Um, <laughs> sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Kelsey. Um, well, just a side note is Lynn, when you, when you said um, to come up with in the classroom, like, as a group, that's something like as an elementary school teacher, that's like what always happens at the beginning of the year. Like you start out with like your classroom, what is it called? Whatever, there's like a fancy name for it. But the number one thing that you do is just be like, what should a, what do you want our classroom to look like, sound like, feel like? And like, you just like go through it so that you can always reference like, look, these are the rules that we've all come up with like are we being this way right now and I think right. that that helps with community um but aside from that I was wondering about the um the first no is it the second article I think that was talking about like phones being to deal with anxiety um or, or to deal with memory but I I almost feel like I'm more interested in attention like was there any right. Because I know that like, if I, I like, I have my phone right next to me, like, if I like, I can choose to be on it or not, but like having it next to me is like, it's a thing that I'm aware of, you know, and I just wonder, was what did you find any um, articles that talked about just like, I mean, you kind of talked about the temptation of it being close is it or it, you know, as it being far away, but I'm wondering if there's anything right. about, just attention in general, like our kids just like checking out because they're used to like flipping all the time through yeah, I did. Um, one of the other studies talks about um, like, uh, I lost my train of thought. Let me just, let me pull that one up actually. Take a quick peek. But. Well, and in the meantime, it take up, you know, we're not going to take a five minute break. So make uh, your notes on the jam board. We're going to take just a, a minute transition in a second, in a moment. Th this, it's interesting that we've, we've hit on topics so far that are that are so generative. You can see that we're, we're really being drawn into them. Um, so if you wanna share that, um, but I just also wanted to say, I have a student in the action research course, the EDU 643, it's also EDU 667, studying her cell phone policy in her high school with her students now. And so I'm uh, gonna make sure that I share those articles with her, but it's actively of interest yeah, so uh, like I was saying, one before I forgot, one of the uh, studies talks about they have college students observe, I think, a very variations of other age students, so middle school, high school, undergrad, and then um, I think maybe not undergrad, but like nearly graduating. And they just observe them for 15 minutes while they're studying. They're told to just study as they normally would. And they're told that the purpose of their study or the research is to just see how people study. So they're not really saying like, we want to see how, how distracted you are, or what you're doing on your phone or all that. And they do see, you know, a marked difference. in if students have a phone nearby, how frequently 
they're going to that and how often. And it's, I mean, it's pretty depressing. It's like, you know, within two or three minutes, you know, people go to it and, and then they talk about the reasons for that, which I thought was interesting. Like sometimes it's because the students are bored, which seems pretty logical, but then sometimes it's because they find the material too difficult. So that's their way of like checking out for a bit. I'm not sure that it really does any good, but um, they give me something to think about because I always just assume that the kids are bored or or uh, not interested or or whatever. But. Well, you're giving me, you know, maybe uh, we'll work out something of that the um, a couple of the studies I could see as I think of this could go onto the Google site uh, or Google folders that we do have, so I could share some of those. Uh, that you have uh, Ben as well. So I think it's this is one of those we've we've hit a real nerve. So thank you, Ben, for, for hitting the cell phone nerve, which I think uh, mm -hmm. is all part of our our makeup now. So um, now let's let's see where there's Jenna. Hey, Jenna. So let's transition hey. right over to Jenna. Um, glad you awesome. can. Thank you for volunteering. And I'm sure this is going to be something completely different. I was a little worried when Ben said, you know, this is a good segue into mine. Because I was like, wow, and now for something completely different. But then you <laughs> talked about phone addiction and all of my studies are about treating substance use in adolescence. So it connects. Uh, yeah, there you <laughs> go. So um, I'm not an education student, I'm in counseling. So um, it's, um, so my focus, is on adolescence and substance use in general. And I thought that would be a good area to study. And I wanted to see in looking at the research, you know, what really what was out there for research right now, what's current um, as far as best practices and how we're treating adolescents now. Um, and I was interested to find there were not as many studies as I wanted there to be. Um, but there was a good, a good mix of quantitative and qualitative. So the two that I'm looking at, and I'm going to try to share my screen with you now. Um, goodness, this is not working right. Um, anyway, the two that I'm going to talk to you about um, are a lot about. Um, perception of use or reasons for use and then perceptions of risk behaviors. Um, so let's try this again with the sharing and I'll bring up my matrix for you. Uh, I'm sorry, Jeff, this is not letting me share for some reason. Um, Jeff, you're mu muted. We can see your mouth moving. But yeah. The best thing I can do is turn it on and off. So try it again now. Okay. Hmm. So if you go to that share screen, is yeah. it not seeing your screen or just not kicking? It's not seeing my screens. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Sorry, I guess we needed the five minute break so I can tech test. Um, Send it to someone. We could probably share our screen. I don't know if that would. Awesome. Put it in the, share, send it to me and I can share it for you. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. So I like the connection you made though. The connection I made or the connection? Yeah, the connection. Well, the, oh, oh. yeah, sending, sending email. That's a great connection. No, send, the, make, the connection around uh, the behavior, addictive behavior and the, um, cell phone. So got it. Yeah. Thank you. Here it is. So, Sharing right okay. now. Thank you. At least that's see. I think that's the one. Let me just make sure. So, oh, there it is. Okay, great. So the, the first article is um, actually, Jeff, do you mind scrolling down to the second one first? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Because um, this is the one that I, I really like felt a strong connection to. And it's all about adolescents' reasons for substance use um, as a way of informing how we treat it. So 
what they were looking, it's a quantitative study, uh, repeated measures, so they tested them at intervals um, to determine if their reasons for using substances affect how they respond to treatment um, and whether or not treatment's successful. And they coded them based on whether it's a negative reinforcement or a positive. So are they using substances to feel good or to feel better? So like um, a negative reinforcement reason would be like drinking to escape, you know, or like self-medicating an untreated mental health condition. Um, positive reinforcement is just being drunk is fun uh, or I like the way I feel. Um, and they, the rationale for the study was that prior research on reasons for alcohol use indicated that drinking to cope or to feel better is more likely to lead to alcohol use disorder symptoms. So they wanted to see, you know, how that could impact treatment. Um, they drew a sample from 178 adolescents who began treatment during the enrollment period. Um, of the 160 eligible for participation, 127 enrolled, and 109 were used for analysis. Uh, it was mostly male, mostly white, average age 16 and a half years. Um, there was an approximately equal distribution of reason for use among this sample. So what was interesting about that, there were no demographic differences. It was well distributed, but the negative reinforcement group had much higher rates of psychopathology. So like internalizing disorders, um, anxiety, depression, et cetera. And they also had more severe substance use. So <laughs> condensing the, um, I'm pointing at my screen, so I was condensing the, um, the assessment they used was hard to do for this matrix. They used a lot of them and they went into great detail about the validity and reliability um, of each assessment individually, which I thought made it an especially strong study because they broke it down by measure and they used there. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> um, so they had these measures at intake and then they also had others at intake and at three, six and 12 months during treatment or after the start of treatment. Um, and in addition to that, they compared what they were, what adolescents were reporting as far as their percentage of days abstinent or um, not using substances. They used biological verification to determine if reporting was accurate. Um, they used a lot of statistical analysis <laughs> that Jeff, I was relieved when you said last week or the week before, it's okay if you don't understand the details of all of the statistical analysis fully, um, you can still talk about it. So Jeff is circling that for you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and what they found was that reason for use was moderately predictive of treatment outcomes. Um, what, what was interesting to me as a future practitioner about the, about the results is that the positive reinforcement group didn't have any significant benefit to standard treatment, but the negative reinforcement group had a significant positive treatment response uh, with a medium effect size. So that, that existed both during treatment and up to six months after treatment. Um, and what's important about that, that, that I wanna see happen is if we can separate out the reasons for use and then structure treatment based on that, we're gonna see a lot more um, data showing that treatment is effective, which is likely to increase funding for treatment programs. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, if we're, only if we're only assessing the efficacy of treatment based on the whole group and for half of the group, it's not the most effective treatment, then the treatment overall is gonna look less effective. Um, so um, I found this to be overall a high quality study. Um, theory and treatment were strong. They clearly identified and defined the variables, the treatment and the type of reason for use. Um, sample and sampling were also strong. They thoroughly described the rationale for the sample, eligibility requirements, limitations were identified. Um, and data collection was also very strong in this study. Um, the amount of detail they gave on those assessments, like I, I'm not used to seeing that in the studies that I read. I read a whole bunch to the, you know, 
decide which ones I wanted to use. And that was a unique factor um, for this particular study. So um, I think that's it on that one. And then the next one is actually above. Um, college student knowledge of blackouts and implications for alcohol intervention. Um, I selected this one to present because I thought it might be more relevant um, for all of you working with kids and some of you working with high schoolers. Um, this one was, you know, the purpose was to de determine the depth, breadth, and accuracy of college students' understanding of the factors that may put them at greater risk of alcohol-induced blackouts. Um, but they also wanted to get suggestions from the participants. So I like that it wasn't just, can we identify the knowledge gaps, but it was also, let's identify this, and what do you think we should be doing, students? You know, how, how can we better help you help yourselves or help each other? Um, so this one was qualitative and they said they chose, this was chosen to establish a range of possible responses that were not introduced by the research team. Um, they recruited 50 participants from community and local colleges. Um, and they gave clear eligibility criteria within the study for you know, what they were looking for. And then they stratified them by gender into small groups. And they, they gave the reason for doing that as in discussing you know, blackouts and problematic drinking, sensitive topics were going to come up and they thought that it would make the participants more likely to disclose information if they felt comfortable in their small group. Um, so they said they reached saturation after eight focus groups and they determined that by whether or not they were getting any new information um, from participants. So they used a semi-structured agenda in the groups um, and they had specific questions like, what increases the likelihood of blackouts? Or is there, um, is there a type of alcohol that makes you more likely to blackout? Or um, what can you do to prevent yourself from blacking out? Um, and they recorded everything, transcribed everything, and they also did debrief questionnaires for the participants afterwards. Um, they did collect some quantitative looking data, but they didn't use it for analysis. So uh, I kind of left that out because this is, I wanted to focus on the thematic analysis. Um, they developed their own code book uh, from the focus group agenda and previous literature. Um, and they, they were really vigorous in how they um, ensured accuracy. So they had two people transcribe every session and then they compared their, their transcriptions and then through discussion um, made sure that they had that accurate. And then they also compared how they coded each, um, each focus group and then discussed any discrepancies to make sure it was accurate. And then one of the researchers reviewed that to make sure that they also thought that it was an accurate coding of, of the data gathered in that group. Um, overall, participants lacked accurate information about why blackouts occur, um, risk factors for them, what they could do to prevent them. And um, they also had inconsistent awareness um, of all of the risk factors. So some people seem to know that body size might be a risk factor, but they didn't know that sex might be a risk factor. Um, and it, it seemed that the study, like it both identified where they can move, how they can move forward and also um, what they should do from here. So, um, and where, where education efforts up to this point have, have lagged. Um, and the idea here is that if we identify the gaps in knowledge, we can do a better job of educating students in a way that meets them where they are and says, hey, we should care about this. <laughs> you know, this isn't just us saying, don't do drugs, don't drink beer. This is, you know, hey, we know you're going to drink. Here are the risk factors um, that might apply to you that could lead to a very serious, you know, overdose, blackouts, and so on. Um, so overall, this was a high quality study too, um, for all the reasons that I said. And transferability, I rated this as moderate 
mostly because the authors themselves noted the limitations of their sample, that they only looked at college students and that they weren't studying other same age individuals who maybe aren't enrolled in college um, and that there may be differences in drinking culture um, and also differences in availability of resources and education where like colleges are trying to keep people from drinking until they black out. So they're more likely to offer programs where if you're just out in the world, you might be out at the bar and it's shots, 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 and no one's saying, hey, this is, this is risky. So um, given that though, it's a limitation, but I don't think it's necessarily a significant one. Um, and Jeff, I did have a graph, but I think we'll stick with this since I, I'm trying to share and I still can't. <laughs> So, well, I, 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 I thank you for this. Uh, you know, again, another, uh, it seemed like it wasn't connected, but I think there's, there's certainly something that's relevant. Uh, and uh, I think uh, from both of these articles, we, you know, certainly uh, have seen the power of the method and as well as the topic itself. So thank you. Well done. Well done. Uh, really great. Congratulations uh, for leading us in this conversation. So I just wanted to say something really quickly about the um, this this notion of your. Um, let's see where. How do I get that thing back? Oh, annotate. I'm trying to get my mouse so it'll. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> that your this this idea of double checking of of the codes really yeah. would help to reinforce this dependability of analysis. Yeah. So I think that's something that really helps. That's, that's very strong. And that's something yeah. that you, you can tell when we think of qualitative research and we think generally of, oh, the, you know, this one person is doing this work, but in fact, that's not the case when you take the time to do it well. And this really is a great yeah. example here. So thank you for bringing that uh, article, I can tell that you were curating this very, very carefully. And this is really a great example. I was, I was so impressed by their attention to the accuracy in this study, especially, you know, the studies that we looked at and in other qualitative studies I have, they, they didn't go so deep into it. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly take a look at, uh, at this article as well. I hope hopefully that you've shared those with me so I can, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're constantly, I'm constantly looking to um, replenish and revitalize the articles that I do use. So thank you. Yeah. Thank Other you. thoughts or comments or suggestions for Jenna? Jenna, I wondered on the first study, yeah. did they talk about um, and maybe you mentioned it and I missed it, but did they talk about what the treatment the um, people with addiction issues were receiving? I know yes. You, okay. I'm glad you asked. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So they did. So it's, and I said standard treatment. Um, and I apologize, I didn't clarify that for you all. Um, so what they consider sort of standard treatment for adolescents is a lower intensity outpatient program. Um, which again worked really well for the feel better folks, but not as not as well for the feel good. Um, so in that outpatient treatment, they use um, things like twelve step meetings, cognitive behavioral therapy, those sorts of approaches, like just your like kind of garden variety therapy approaches, is what I like what I would call it, um, and one of the things that this study suggested was that maybe maybe shifting that model for the I use substances just to feel good um, cohort might, might provide better results that, that they're not getting in a mixed group um, and that they're not getting necessarily from like 12 step meetings um, or CBT. They didn't provide specific suggestions, just that there might be something else. So looking forward to that research. Yeah, and I think uh, it timely as well, Jenna, uh, I know that the we're, you hear on, uh, you know, news reports that there's been a, a lot of uptick in um, addiction, self-medication, 
what you know so many things uh, in the last yeah. 14 months you know because we've been so isolated and um you know just the whole world shifted yeah um and they that was one question that sort of came up was that um the reason for use could also indicate um sort of where individuals are kind of along the timeline or continuum of of addiction that especially for some substances people will start using because it feels good and then as things change and as they become more dependent then it's to feel better mm -hmm. you know as you're going through withdrawal then you're not using it because it feels good you're using it so that you're not sick um, and that it might be it, it might not just be about structuring treatment to initial reason for use but also where are you along that continuum. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. So what I'd like uh, uh, for two things, one of them, uh, you've got the jam boards. I know that you took the time for Ben and for Gabe. Uh, it took, took me a second to post um, Jenna's as I was, I felt like I was, you know, managing the board there and doing all that stuff. And then I got way too involved in annotating. So I don't know, I went all, I went all in on that. But, you also, My bad. I'm sorry. I thought. <laughs> no, no, no. I I'm glad that you, you reminded me. Here. Not at all. Okay. Not at all. I, you know, I, you know, I, I need a little reminder. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that if you would, those of you who are going to be um, doing your, so next week, no class. Although I will be here if you want any consultation. <laughs> Don't be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> So, it's been a long week, okay? It's been, oh, believe me, it has been a really long week. Um, but uh, in two weeks, there, the, I'd like to have the topic. So if you would take a moment to, uh, and write the title that you would like me to put in the, the program, if you will, so I can sort everyone into groups, kind of get an idea of how the groups might be formed um, in the chat box. So what would the title be that you would like, because I can make up titles, but what would the title for your research conversation be? Please write that in. Uh, once you do that, once you do the Jamboard, thank you so much. It's been uh, terrific, Gabe and Ben and Jenna. Thank you so much for taking the step. Um, and I hope it was worthwhile. Uh, now you get to breathe a little easier and uh, take some time to relax. Can I make a quick plug? Sure, plug away. We have a, we have a Center for Compassion event next Thursday at four mm -hmm. um, for Earth Day. Uh -huh. And it's about eco-womanism as uh -huh. a spiritual practice, which is a fascinating subject for study. And our guest speaker is Dr. Melanie Harris, who's just brilliant and lovely. So if you're not busy next Thursday at four. Well, if, you uh, want, if you'd like to plug a little harder, put the, put the <laughs> link in the... Uh, I'm gonna. <laughs> So and that's one of your your uh, you're uh, one of the um, uh, is it an admin for mm -hmm. the Center for Compassion and the director for the Center for Compassion is Dr. Vashali uh, Mumbai. Vashali, yeah, yeah, she's a and professor of economics. Yeah, right. Okay, well, great. If, <laughs> if if yeah, really, if you have any time, and if I do, um, we'll sign yeah. in. We'd love to see it. It's on Zoom, so it's great. easy, and I'm putting the link in now. Okay. Right well, if not, have a great two weeks. If you need anything, let me know. I'm give I give pretty quick feedback. So enjoy the um, the next two weeks of April. See you um, April 29th. That's scary. <laughs> Bye, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff.